Well, thank you very much again for uh, being so bright and bushy-tailed early in the morning uh, and for your interest in the newborn brain. So I'm going to speak about predominantly qualitative common neonatal lesions that are seen while imaging infants um, in our hands too that are uh, unsedated. I have no relevant financial uh, interest to disclose. So I'm going to talk around what I think are the important ingredients initially in terms of getting optimal imaging in the newborn, and then what the common lesions are. And we're going to touch on both the term-born infant and the prematurely born infant. I'll talk a little bit about the biology of the vulnerability that you would see displayed and the types of lesions that you would see. So what are the important ingredients? And I feel it's really uh, an opportunity to touch on this because this is a clinical session and many of you may be working in clinical neuroradiology departments. So there's need for really good communication between the clinical and the radiology team. And this seems uh, implicitly obvious, but it often is sort of not done as well as it could. The intern at the uh, neonatal intensive care unit just puts down MRI brain question injury without really the details that the radiologist needs to be able to understand what is it that they really think is going on with this baby, what's the question that's really being applied to the imaging. At the same time, they might not even order the right type of sequence for the type of question that they really are having. And does that include spectroscopy? Does it include any type of vascular studies? What's present in the images is clearly the responsibility of reporting of radiology, but sometimes it can be you know, equally shared and discussed. And then the implications of what's found in the imaging for the uh, family and the infant uh, fall back to the clinician. But this uh, bridge, particularly for neuroradiology, is sometimes challenging. In neonatal intensive care, we'll often have chest X-ray rounds every day, but you won't often have the same privilege of contact with neuroradiology. So we've tried to bring in and found it extraordinarily helpful to have regular co-review of the images, and we actually do it on a daily basis now, but some people will find it just as useful to do it weekly. And then to review, at least uh, annually, if not every quarterly, how many infants are being imaged? What kinds of abnormalities are you finding? What types of schema are you used for imaging at the moment, and can they be improved? So I'd encourage you to really think about that as you look at some of these lesions and think, are you, you, know, are you doing this in your clinical practice at the moment? So when we look at the different types of ages that we're going to talk about, the first uh, baby group that we're going to talk about are the term-born infants. And term-born infants have a particular uh, vulnerability within the grey matter, that of the cortical and the deep nuclear grey matter. Their lesions are often so-called watersheds, and these watersheds are either vascular or they're metabolic. And that impact on the grey matter means these infants often present with impaired mental state or encephalopathy and or clinical or electroencephalographic seizures. These are the two common patterns that are described on MR imaging, particularly in relationship to so-called acute encephalopathy presenting shortly after birth. And you can see that in these two patterns shown here, these are DWI images, but you can see that the brightness here in the deep nuclear gray matter involving all the thalamus, putamen globus, and the caudate, but no other region of the cortex, so-called isolated deep nuclear gray matter lesions. Or here, this pattern of watershed in the vascular territories between the anterior and the middle, or the middle and the posterior, involving predominantly the cortical gray matter with some underlying white matter injury, often in this sort of wedge-shaped vascular watershed. The deep nuclear grey matter are extraordinarily vulnerable in infants as they are in children, as you are all aware, in the setting of acute asphyxia because of their high metabolic demand. So if you like, this is a metabolic watershed and this is a vascular watershed. And these two infant groups present differently. So when you're the radiologist looking at the patterns, some things are interesting clues for these patterns of injury have been described in the deep nuclear grey matter and infants who have come from acute sentinel events like placental uh, ruptures or cord prolapses or motor vehicle accidents. These infants often are very acidemic. They require a lot of resuscitation. Everybody recognises them straight away that they could be in trouble. And they often have other end organ dysfunction. 
In contrast, these children with the watershed lesions can present more uh, benignly. There can be no clues during the labour that there was anything going wrong. They're not as acidemic. They may not have had much resuscitation, and in fact, sometimes they present towards about 12 to 24 hours just with some focal seizures. But the outcomes of these two patterns are vastly different. If you look at this isolated deep nuclear grey matter lesion, these babies will be a bit floppy, they may have difficulty feeding, but they'll go on to have a very high risk of later spastic quadriparesis and movement disorders. Um, these children will have more of a risk for specific intellectual impairments or uh, memory, visuospatial or language type of disorders. So the motor deficits are not as prominent. One particular sign radiologically is very important, and that's the presence of this high signal seen here on a flare or a T1 within the posterior limb of the internal capsule bilaterally. And this is felt to probably represent early myelination, but its absence, as seen here, where that high signal is no longer present, is very prognostically powerful and was pointed out by Mary Rutherford and the Imperial College group in this series of babies. If the uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule signal was normal, the outcome of these children in early childhood was normal. If it was abnormal or absent, it was highly likely that these children would develop cerebral palsy or profound motor or cognitive deficits. So one single sign being very potent. As you're all aware, imaging changes following ischemic insults, and it does so in the term infant as well. And this is data from Jim Barkovich and has been repeated by many others, showing that evolution in both the T1 here from early where it is not apparent through to being very apparent within the deep nuclear gray matter, the ADC maps showing some early changes that become more apparent and then disappear by seven days, and spectroscopic changes in early lactate peak, more apparent, and then disappearing. Spectroscopy can be extraordinarily helpful in these infants, and whether it's done at a short or a longer echo time can give you multiple markers that relate to both neuronal integrity, such as the N-acetyl aspartate, or to the presence potentially of energy failure, such as lactate. Here is an infant in our own uh, unit who underwent imaging on day one after an ischemic insult, and you can see this doublet of lactate peak here with a preserved uh, N-acetyl aspartate. And when we image this infant 10 days uh, later, you can see now the lactate is no longer visible, but the NAA peak has fallen, consistent with neuronal loss. Nikki Robinson has uh, looked at the various prognostic power of these different types of imaging techniques, comparing the ADC, the posterior limb of the internal capsule signal, just conventional MRI, or these spectroscopic markers, and indeed shown that the lactate to NAA ratio has the highest sensitivity and specificity for prognostic outcome. Interestingly now, as many of you are aware, we therapeutic hyperthermia to these infants with term encephalopathy, and we do that within the first six hours of life, sometimes the first hour of life. And we cool the baby's body temperature down to 33 and a half degrees, and they stay down for three days. This is achieved usually by either body wraps or by a mattress type uh, approach. And the impact of this particular treatment on these patterns of brain injury was a question that was quite concerning when we first uh, started this treatment. But it's been nicely shown by the TOBY trial group out of the United Kingdom that in fact when you look at the MRI lesions in infants who received this therapeutic hypothermia, you again see evidence that therapeutic hypothermia works because the lesions are reduced in number, so this is about a 60% a reduction overall in the number of abnormalities that are seen in these cooled infants, consistent with the improved outcomes in these infants. But perhaps more importantly, as a clinician, the presence of either cooling or not being cooled in this randomized trial did not alter the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value or negative predictive value of MRI as a whole. In other words, what you saw on the scans 
in infants that had received this treatment was just as prognostically powerful. However, we went on to look at the evolution of the diffusion coefficient in these infants. It had been previously mapped by Jeff uh, Neal and Bob McKinstry, and that's the little grey circles here, to show that if you looked at diffusion coefficient and its pseudonormalization in term infants without hypothermia, you can see that basically it dropped by about day two, and then it's pseudonormalized such that, as we saw previously, by the end of the first week, the ADC was no longer uh, diminished. So this was a situation when the baby was warm. We then went on to study 23 babies with injury who received hypothermia treatment, and what we found was with cooling, there was a similar fall, but the length of time that the ADC took to normalize was longer taking closer to 10 to 14 days before you saw the ADC normalize. And this was of interest because first when we started seeing this and the uh, radiology reports were coming through of infants between four to eight days, people were reporting this as though some insult had occurred two to four days earlier because that's the way we'd all been programmed pre-hypothermia. And in fact, that's not the case. This tail is just a lot longer. It gives us hope, however, that there are processes going on here that may be amenable to further neuroprotective strategies after the rewarming process on day three. So what do we do currently in your practice? You will know, but I can share with you data from other practices. We have been part of a registry for the Vermont Oxford Neonatal Network and have collected data over a two-year period from 70 centres around the world. These babies got into this registry if they received therapeutic hypothermia, which 20% of the babies did. If they were term babies and they had stupor or coma, seizures, or they were profoundly low at the time of birth, needing a lot of aggressive resuscitation, so these are not mildly affected babies. They were excluded if there was any evidence of a central nervous system birth defect. Nearly 100,000 infants were screened in these centres, and all of the centres declared that they had full access to MRI imaging. There were 1,743 babies that met the criteria, or about 2% of infants. And there were 2% of those infants, or only 34, that even though no one thought they had a cerebral dysgenesis, it turned out on later imaging that they did. When we looked at the infants that remained, 82% of them underwent some form of neuroimaging. Now, I thought that was sort of interesting. It meant that 18% didn't get any kind of neuroimaging. And I thought initially there is a pretty high um, mortality rate. So this will just be because these babies were so sick that they all you know, passed away before imaging could be done. But I was wrong. So if you look at the infants that did not have any neuroimaging, there was only 62 deaths. So 30 died on day one and 61 by day seven. But the vast majority of those infants that didn't get any imaging survived. So if you look at all infants that were in this category of stupor, coma, seizing, 15% of them got no neuroimaging of any kind at any stage. So if they got neuroimaging, what kind of neuroimaging did they get? Well, about half of them got an ultrasound, a quarter got a CT scan, and two-thirds of them, if they got imaging, got an MRI. And you can see that the timing of those scans is slightly different with the infants getting an MRI closer to a week of age. What did people find on these imaging studies? Well, if you look at the percentage of abnormalities, about a third of the ultrasounds were abnormal, a little over half of the CTs, and two-thirds of the MRIs. But the biggest contributor in the CTs was extraaxial blood. When it came to the types of lesions that we've been talking about, both of these types of lesions, the deep nuclear gray matter and the type of watershed lesion, were poorly seen on ultrasound or CT. And to look at that further, we took 317 infants who had both a CT and an MRI scan and looked at the types of abnormalities. And in fact, if you look at all the infants, and I'm sorry the numbers are missing, 85% uh, had an abnormality on MRI, 
whereas only 31% had a meaningful abnormality on CT. And MR detected 10 times more white matter, three times more deep nuclear grey matter, and twice as many strokes. So MR imaging will reveal more vascular lesions, more white matter, and more deep nuclear grey matter lesion that's prognostically important. But it's important to optimise the request from the clinical team. What are they looking for? The timing of the scan, as we've just talked about, particularly in relationship to when these infants are being treated with therapeutic hypothermia. The sequences of the unsedated term infant. So we'll move now on to the preterm infant who displays a different type of lesion and a different type of biological vulnerability. In comparison to the term infant, the premature infant has vulnerabilities related to immature cell types, and those are particularly in the immature germinal matrix, producing IVH, the immature oligodendroglia, producing PVL, or white matter injury, and the immature cerebellum, producing hemorrhage. Intraventricular hemorrhage can involve anything from just a subependymal hemorrhage through to hemorrhage within the ventricle that may be small or larger, or complicating intraparenchymal hemorrhage. It's readily seen on cranial ultrasound, and as many of you are aware, that is the imaging technique that's used frequently. But if you look at the reporting of cranial ultrasound when it is compared between readers, there are reasons for concern when there are low-grade reportings, as has recently been shown by Susan Hintz at Stanford. It does appear that there's improved prognosis from ultrasound scans as a whole with more frequent scanning to reassure the full extent of the bleed. What does it look like on MRI scanning? This is a coronal MRI T2 weighted on an immature infant. And what you can see here is blood filling the ventricle and a secondary parenchymal venous hemorrhagic infarct here seen. And this occurs because it's believed the blood here has obstructed the drainage from this um, terminal vein, and then there is a secondary venous hemorrhagic rupture within the parenchyma. The major lesion that we've spent a lot of time on with MRI now is that of white matter injury. The immature uh, white matter starts out with this very sort of disorganized fibre organisation prior to sort of an organisation, maturation of these oligodendrocytes and myelination. And within each area, there are various types of cell steps, from the neural stem cell to the oligoprogenitor, the pre-oligodendrocyte, the immature oligodendrocyte putting out its processes before it starts to myelinate. And in the immature brain, it is this pre-oligodendrocyte that we know is very sensitive to injury. If we look at these pre-oligodendrocytes, there are multiple pathways, but particularly ischemia and inflammation, which then activate microglia to produce both free radicals, cytokines, glutamate, which lead to the pre-oligodendrocyte. Oh, we've lost the screen over here. Pre-oligodendrocyte being gone. Maybe a plug. <laughs> various lights flashing on the uh, projector. <laughs> do you want to move over or what, do you want me to keep going? You can move on mass. We're a friendly bunch. <laughs> <It's a migration>. <laughs> <laughs> it's designed to wake you up. <laughs> there we go. You'll all be more lively now. Whoever's left behind. <laughs> it's going to self-identify. Right, if you see anyone asleep, wake them up. So this is the pathway by which these uh, oligodendrocytes are vulnerable to injury and which renders the immature cerebral white matter to be so vulnerable. So what types of lesions do we look for when we are looking for imaging uh, abnormalities? 
So uh, we are all familiar with cystic type infarctions that we often see which are focal, but we've spent a lot of time now in imaging, understanding these more diffuse markers of abnormality and these focal punctate lesions that we see. And what do these look like on imaging? Well, these are uh, coronal T1-weighted images from Stephen Miller's paper. And you can see here a very minimal little punctate lesion within the posterior cerebral white matter, a little more prominent punctate lesion, or multiple punctate lesions. There's also been a lot of debate about the significance of this diffuse excessive high signal intensity which was reported on T2-weighted MRI imaging, and these are axial T2-weighted from two preterm infants, and you can see that this is a, a not as bright as this uh, cerebral white matter is, and this is the so-called DESI. We have also been interested in defining these and have tended to look more globally at not just the punctate lesions, but loss of volume of the cerebral white matter, as you can see in this infant here, where there's a little bit of ventricular megaly and the cortical gray matter appears to be almost touching with a loss of white matter volume. So to start with, I just wanted to get DESI out of the way because we have recently evaluated 160 infants uh, with Hiroyuku Kirikoro from Japan, and he evaluated gradings of DESI here from um, no DESI or minimal DESI through to more marked or global high signal intensity. When he did this across these 160 infants and looked at it at term in relationship to two-year both cognitive and motor outcomes, we found no difference across these groups of increasing severity of uh, this high signal intensity. And hence, I won't discuss that particular finding in any more detail because we don't uh, believe anymore that this is a finding of major prognostic significance for the preterm infant. Instead, we'll look at other lesions and before going to looking at injury as a whole, and that is cerebellar hemorrhage. Cerebellar hemorrhage has a pretty low detection rate on cranial ultrasound, and it's estimated from pathology studies that as many as 20% of these babies may have this lesion. There's a major overlap mechanistically with IVH, and in our current study, 23% of our infants less than 30 weeks had this lesion, and on only three of them could we see it on cranial ultrasound. So it's very difficult, even when you know exactly where the lesion is, to see it with posterior, these are posterior views on the cranial ultrasound. The outcome of this lesion has been suggested to be very important with Kathy Leparopoulos showing us that this lesion can be associated with a severe burden of cognitive motor and semi-autistic type features. So again, Hiroyuku Kitakuro took images from close to uh, or over 300 of our scans that have been in various cohorts and re-evaluated them for these punctate lesions, linear uh, high signal intensities or cystic lesions for white matter abnormality, for intraventricular hemorrhage, and for cerebellar hemorrhage with a small unilateral, small bilateral, large unilateral or large bilateral. When we looked at these infants, it's important to note that the vast majority, uh, over 70% or close to 70%, did not have any of these patterns of injury. And yet their cognitive performance, this is the MDI, and their PDI were low. So clearly the injury already wasn't explaining everything. Then when we filled in the injury, what you can see is that it is the high-grade injury with white matter lesions or IVH where we saw deviations downward from that without injury for both cognition and motor and an elevation in the rates of cerebral palsy. But as a whole, these infants with high-grade IVH or high-grade white matter injury only accounted for 10% of the cohort. Low-grade injury, at least at two years of outcome, did not influence um, the outcome. And for high-grade cerebellar hemorrhages, we are too early to say. But we noticed right from the start of doing these studies, way back when I started working in this area with Petra Hupi, when she applied the first volumetric techniques, that there was something else going on in these brains that wasn't just injury injury. 
And so here were two infants who came to the scanner on the same day in Melbourne. They were both born around 25 weeks gestation. Their parents were excited because they'd had normal ultrasounds. But you can see when you put them in the scanner that they are clearly not the same. They had not had any documented injury. But what is this lesion? It's been defined by us and by Joe Volpe as a diffuse encephalopathy of prematurity, but really it's an impairment in some way in growth. So to capture this, we've been using brain metrics that were adapted from fetal atlases to look at biparietal width, interhemispheric distances, cerebellar widths, as well as other measures. We've found that a smaller brain width relates to growth in utero or IUGR in multiple birth, and it also relates to outcome at two years that these enlarged interhemispheric gaps are commoner in boys and they are influenced by things like postnatal steroid exposure and that fentanyl use uh, is associated with a smaller frontal lobe width and smaller cerebellum. So we've coined and tried to distinguish the difference between a small brain and a brain that didn't grow well with a large interhemispheric distance. And I'll just walk you through this graph. This is Hiroyuki's way of looking at brain size like a sweater. Extra small, small, medium, large, or extra large. And then uh, if you look at the open circles, this looks at cognition at two years against brain width at the time you go home from the hospital. And you can see that across this is a small trend, but really until you get to a very small, extra small brain, more than one and a half standard deviations below what you should corrected for gender, that you really don't see a big difference. When we then superimposed, if you had an enlarged hem into hemispheric space, in other words, was your brain sort of hypoplastic or not fully growing? And what you can see now is that no matter, even if you have a large brain, if your brain somehow did not reach the size it wanted to, you lose significant IQ points for cognition. There was no impact on motor outcomes. This was purely on cognitive outcomes. Interestingly, again, as we often see, this effect was almost uh, isolated to male infants. Advanced imaging is taking us to the next step in the preterm infant with very elegant work being done on volumes, tractography, cortical surface analysis, and resting state functional connectivity, some of which you've seen presented at this meeting. And David Van Essen, Jason Hill, Donna Decker, and Jeff Neal have been looking at comparing healthy term-born infants to that of premature infants leaving the unit. And as you can see here, our little premature babies are saying, what did I do wrong because I clearly don't look like you over there, particularly around the temporal lobes and the inferior frontal areas. So to summarize, the common lesions we see in the newborn brain I'd like to emphasize again that to be able to see these lesions and scan infants, you really need to optimize the clinical radiological interface. And this is clearly not happening for a large number of infants, as I showed you from the Vermont Oxford. Nearly a third of all infants with stupor, coma, or seizures are not getting access to MR imaging. For the term infant, MR is the optimal identification of the common lesions within the gray matter, the timing that you undertake the scan may differ depending on uh, what your clinical requirement is. In other words, if you are trying to determine whether an infant should be continued on intensive care or you want the greatest sensitivity for smaller type lesions. I will continue to say that we should be advocating to avoid CT and gain access for these infants to high quality MR imaging, particularly unsedated. For the premature infant, MR is also the optimal method for uh, identifying white matter lesions, cerebellar hemorrhages, and impaired growth. And we advocate that an MR image should be considered prior to discharge for preterm infants. So with that, I hope you will all continue to want to look at the inside of many of our babies. And uh, if you wish to know more, we hope to continue to educate with courses such as that that we run in St. Louis later this year. And with thanks to particularly my husband and our team in St. Louis, and to you all for being so attentive and mobile throughout the talk. Thanks.